announcement before class starts. This is Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy. I'm with Sweet. And I just want to let you guys know that this uh, next Thursday we have an event, a uh, mock interview event, and there will be companies there like Chevron, Goldman, Moog, Sandia, or Sandia National Labs, and Space Dynamics Lab, and there's some other ones. And you can just bring your resume in and just kind of like business casual, and then they'll just go through some mock interviews with you guys and give you guys feedback. And this is great for like the upcoming stuff there and any other interview you have. And also there's free food. So it's uh, next Thursday, 6 to 8, at the Career Services Building, or Center. It's in the Student Services Building, uh, 365, or 350, sorry. So I hope to see you guys there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, at our faculty retreat this past fall, the dean was there and he was complaining about the slovenly appearance of Utah engineering students. Okay, so I think none of us are wearing business casual right now. I can't know for sure. Anyway, dress up and just with these things. Okay, so you have. Um, PS3 is coming due. PS4 will be out today or tomorrow. We do next week. Any problems, questions before we start? <coughs> yep. I'm just going to say it. Those quizzes were pretty hard. Um, is that kind of hard for the rest of the course? If I thought those quizzes were hard, will that kind of be a tendency? Yeah. I, I don't think this, this week is any harder or easier than any. Okay. Most other weeks. So I'll adjust my expectations. There's five quizzes. <laughs> well, he's saying there's five instead of four. I mean, I could make one quiz and just put all the questions on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. We're going to finish up with divide and conquer. by uh, proving a uh, lower bound, a lower bound on comparison-based sort. And to, we're going to sneak up on that by first talking about insertion sort. So suppose that we're using insertion sort to sort that array A, B, C. The letters stand for unknown integers. So how many possible results are there sorting three things? How many different permutations can we get depending on what A, B, and C really stand for? Six, three factorial. So there's, if you have n elements in an array, there's n factorial possible ways to sort them. And we're going to build what's called a decision tree. So this is a decision tree specifically for insertion sort. And the way I'm going to draw it is, what insertion sort is looking at is what's in blue up there. So that ABC is what insertion sort sees before it makes its first decision. And What's in black is uh, I'm just adding some additional notation, which is those are the other, those are the remaining, those are the possibilities for what the answer might really be. So initially, we made no comparisons, and so any possible permutation of ABC is a possible outcome. So just to remind you, what's in blue is what the search sort is really seeing. What's in black is what we know because we're, we're all knowing about what the algorithm can do. So what's the first question, the first, the first comparison that insertion sort would do? It's looking at that blue array. Yeah? It compares B and A. It'll compare A and B, right? It compares the first two elements to decide whether to slide B past A. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'll make the, this is what a decision tree is. We keep track of all the decisions. We actually graph all the decisions that insertion sort might make. So it's going to ask the question, is B less than A? Now, if the answer is no, then insertion sort won't do anything with the array, right? It's not going to exchange B and A. But, if, uh, but from our position of being all-knowing, which possibilities are ruled out at that point? If we, we, have, we know now that if, if, if insertion sort goes down the no branch, we know that B is less than A, uh, that B is not less than A. Okay? Only the first option remains. Well, the first option remains certain, because that's consistent. Oh, yeah. yeah. So how can we tell which options remain? Yeah? Um, based on the 
basically any one of the ones where B comes before A. We can rule out. Yeah. Right. So anything where B comes before A is not an, an outcome that's going to happen. <laughs> so we can scratch off, uh, let's see, the first one's okay, the second one's okay, the third one's bad, because B can't possibly come before A given what we now know. Uh, the fourth one, bad. The, uh, the last one is bad. So anyway, that's what we get to. So if insertion sort is running and it makes that comparison, we know we can predict at that point only because we, you know, we're doing things, you know, we're looking at insertion sort from afar and we know all about it. We know these are possible. All insertion sort knows is that it's just made this one comparison and it's kept the array like that. So what's the next question? So when insertion sort's in this state. When it's compared B to A and found out B is uh, not less than A, what will it do next? Yeah? Compare B and C. Okay, it'll compare B and C. So it tried to push, it's pushed B as far to the left as it can go. Now it's going to try to push C to the left as far as it can go. So that's the comparison that's made. Now, what if the answer is no to that? So once again, it's not going to modify the blue part. What possibilities get ruled out at that point? Yeah. C can't be to the left of B. Right, C can't be to the left of B, and, and that's, that's the case in both of these situations. And so, uh, that's the only possibility remaining. Now, what does insertion sort do? It's made, just made those two comparisons. What does it do next? It's, it's done, right? If, if, if you can't move B past A and it can't move C past B, it's done. And in fact, it would, it would leave the array in that state. So we're just keeping, we're, we're drawing a tree of all the possible ways that insertion sort could unfold. And the way it unfolds depends on what A, B, and C really are, what numbers they do. Well, back to this one here. Okay? What if it found out that C was less than B? Okay, so it's going to, uh, it's, it's going to move C past B, getting us... A, C, B, and those two possibilities are the only ones left. So we end up looking like this. So it rearranges the array to look like that. And this is the only poss other possibility. Okay? So it's moved C past B. What's the next comparison insertion sort does? Yeah? All right, try to compare C and A to see if C can move past A. If the answer is no, then it's going to leave it in that form, A, C, B, and it's done. If the answer is yes, it'll move C past, and it's done there as well, because it can't move C any further. So we've sort of mapped out half of this tree. Now, back at the, back at the top, I'm not going to belabor the example, but if the answer was yes, B is less than A, it would move uh, B past A, and these would be the three remaining possibilities. Then it would do what comparison? No, it's not done. <laughs> right, it'll pair, compare C and A. Try to push C to the left. And if the answer is no, C is uh, not less than A, we're done. B, A, C is the answer. Otherwise, we've got a question in, in that. So, we, we took what we know about insertion sort, we assumed there were three elements, we mapped out all the possible sequence of decisions that could, that could happen. <coughs> So what is the significance of one branch in the tree, one, one path from the root to a, uh, to a leaf node in a decision tree? What does that correspond to? Yeah? Well, he said complexity. That's actually kind of true. It's like you can count the number of comparisons that were done with that branch. Longer branches mean longer complexities. What's another way to get a branch? Each one corresponds to a permutation. It ends up at a different permutation in this case. But what I'm after is it's, it's some path that, you know, in search and source, you're not going to do all of these things. If you give it an array, it's going to follow one of these branches, one of these paths, depending on how the array is initially permuted. Yeah? Is there a reason why it's colored blue, some of the text? Why it's called what? Why it's colored blue. What does it mean? Okay, the blue is what insertion sort is what the insertion looks like, what the array looks like to insertion sort currently. Right? The black is just our annotation. Insertion sort initially sees A B C. If it does a swap, it sees B A C. 
which is what it sees. Blue is what the searching sort knows. Black is what we also know. Okay, so let's ask some questions about this. How many leaves are in the decision tree? Six. 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 All right, which is three factorial. How many leaves would there be if we did this for n elements? There would be at least n factorial. It, it might be, you know, I haven't figured it out. Um, it might be that there's multiple ways to get to the same sort. Right? You might have one path that leads into a particular permutation and a different path that leads to the same permutation. But in any event, there have to be at least n factorial leaves. Okay? What's the length of the longest path in the tree we just had? If you count comparisons. For... for for the one that we just saw, the three element example. Three. Right, three. And what's the length of the shortest path? There, was, there were some paths with two, some with three. Okay, what if we had n elements? What would the length of the longest path be for insertion sorts decision tree? N squared minus. Yeah, I mean, you got to get, you know, it's, it's something like n squared. It turns out it's n times n minus 1 over 2 would be the length of that, because that's just the worst case for insertion sort. So the longest path in, an assert, in a decision tree for an algorithm is going to correspond to its worst case. What about the best case? What's the shortest path for the insertion sort decision tree? How many comparisons would it do in the best case? N minus 1. Okay? All right. So, that's insert, that, so right here where some of these questions are about the specific decision tree we built for three elements, um, the uh, rest are about sort of <coughs> imagining what an N element tree would look like. Uh, an element tree. And, you know, if I asked you to do it for even four elements, you'd get a void. Go see blows up pretty fast. Doing it for 100 elements, nothing you'd want to do. It's just sort of a, an exercise you can imagine doing. All right. So let's just, rather than doing it for merge sort, let's think about it. What would be the shape of a decision tree for merge sort? So you, suppose you did a tree for merge sort with 100 elements. <coughs> what would the shape? Okay, saying it's balanced. Anyone have a different idea? Why would it, someone else tell me why it would be sort of balanced? Why would merge sorts tree be pretty well balanced as opposed to insertion sorts tree? Yeah? Is that because it always divides the array in half? It well, it's a, it's a consequence of the fact that it always divides the array in half. But why would there not be any extremely short or extremely long branches? Yeah? So they're not sorted, it does the same steps. Right. It, it, so merge sort is sort of insensitive to initial ordering of things. It, it just it splits it in half. Sorts the two halves. Uh, and, you know, it's worst case and it's best case of both in log in. So we'd expect all of the paths to be about the same length. So we would, uh, we would expect to see uh, all the paths about the same length, and again, at least n factorial leaf nodes for if we start with n, n elements. What about for quick sort? No. Raise your hand if you got something to say. I'll give other people a chance first. Right. Okay, Anthony. So it would be mostly balanced, but you have a couple of them that go like really long. Okay, so he said it would be mostly balanced, but there would be some really long branches. Okay? Think about insertion sort. For n elements, it had some branches that are n minus 1 long, some that are, you know, n squared long. Why would a quick sort be like sort of uh, some short branches, but also some extremely long ones? What's that? Yeah. There's a oh, let me, let me get in. Because the, because of the worst case, it's kind of like, uh, you have like, like remember a while ago when we had like that binary kind of stick? Mm -hmm. It talks about, yeah, it'd be something like yeah. that. Yeah. Quicksort just has that bad worst case, so there'd be some really long branches and, and some, uh, and again, at least in factorial leaf nodes. Okay, now, suppose somewhere out there, Maybe it has been discovered and named. Maybe it has not been discovered. But imagine the, the best, the, the, the sorting algorithm that has the absolutely fastest worst case. Okay? I'm going to try to imagine that algorithm. 
what would the shape of this decision tree be? What characteristics would the world's fastest outcome, again, for worst case, the one that does the fewest comparisons in the worst case? What would you expect it to look like? Yeah? The worst case would be as good as the fast case, or the best case. Right, so what does that say? The worst case, what, what does it say, about though, about the shape of the tree? It's completely balanced. Right, you'd expect, if you're trying to minimize the worst case, you'd want it to be, be perfectly balanced. You wouldn't want to have any, you know, the, out, the, the, one, the longest branch is corresponding to the worst case. So you, the, it, it would, the best you could ever do would be to completely balance your decision tree. How many nodes would there be? And for an n element decision tree for the world's best algorithm. What's that? N factorial. N factorial. Not at least n factorial. You would think the best you could do is exactly n factorial. Okay, so completely balanced, exactly n factorial leaf nodes. Okay, so what we've done is I've, I've shown you, I've talked about what a decision tree is, I've illustrated them, I've shown you that you can imagine what these trees would look like for different algorithms that you know. And right now I'm just asking you to imagine one for an algorithm you may not know. Whatever the, you know, it, you know, maybe an algorithm no one has discovered yet, but the best possible thing you could end up with would be a completely balanced decision tree with n factorial leaf nodes. Yeah? I'm a little, I'm a little bit confused about the part how the first two have at least n factorial, or that one has exactly n factorial. Right. So what would be like the maximum leaves like on a merge short? Would be like. Well, okay, so she's, what, let me repeat her question. Why do I keep saying at least n factorial? It's because I haven't thought that hard about the algorithms to decide. I could write an algorithm that, that spent uh, some time doing comparisons and just ignoring the results. And then started sorting for real. If that were the case, there could be multiple paths to the same sorted result. And I haven't thought hard enough about Mercer and search and sort for quick sorts to decide whether there's multiple paths that lead to the same result. Okay. Uh, but I do know that if you're trying to make sort of the, we want, our, we want the smallest possible balanced decision tree, that's sort of the best we can do. And so I'm going to say, the, the, in the world's best algorithm, you would have exactly n factorial leaf nodes, and it would be as balanced as possible, because we want to minimize the height of the tree. The broader it is, the higher it has to be, because it's a binary tree. So we want, we want the number of leaf nodes to be small, and we want to be balanced so that there's not a bad worst case. Yeah. So, right now we're branching every step to two new possibilities. Is there a way to make it branch faster so it can get it down? Okay, so now he's asking, can we make it branch faster, like branch three ways? Okay. Uh, you could. You could have a three-way branch. It would. Uh, our analysis. The only change in our analysis would be would be talking about log base three instead of log base two in the end. But for now, we're. We're assume, what we're assuming about the algorithm that's doing the sorting is all it can do is a single, it can only compare the elements and swap them. We're not, we're assuming, we're not doing three-way comparisons. We're not looking at the bits inside. We're not using the things as indexes. We're not hashing the elements in the set, anything like that. We're, all we can do is compare, and that's why a comparison tree is appropriate. Okay, so if we have a balanced binary tree, forget about decision trees for a moment, a perfectly balanced binary tree with n leaf nodes, what's its height? Log of n, okay, give or take. Yeah, maybe it's log of n minus 1. Okay, so that's the height. So, what's the height, the longest path length, of a balanced binary tree with n factorial leaf nodes? Log of n factorial. Okay, so that says that the world's best sorting algorithm, in the worst case sense, is going to take at least log of n factorial steps log of n factorial comparisons in the worst case. That's the best we can hope to do. There may not even be an algorithm that has a perfectly balanced tree with exactly n factorial leaf nodes. But that's the best you could hope to do. All right. So we can, so we can put that lower bound on all comparison-based sorts. Theta, uh, uh, omega of n factorial. The worst case can't be better than that if you're doing comparison-based sort. Question is, what is log of n factorial? That looks kind of weird. Turns out it's pretty simple. Log of n factorial is the log of 1 times 2 all the way up to n. But what's that? 
it's the log of this, it's the sum of all those logs. And I'm going to say that's less than or equal to that. You buy that? Log 1 plus log 2 all plus all the way up to log n is less than or equal to log of n plus log of n plus log of n the same number of times. Right? We're replacing, but, you know, log n is going to be bigger than log 1, log n is going to be bigger than log 2, so we're making it bigger. And that's just n log n. So n log n is an upper bound on log of n factorial. Okay? Now let's do it a different way. Okay? It's that sum. Now I'm going to replace half of the terms. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to if this, this was n terms long, I'm going to add up n, occur, n over 2 occurrences of log of n over 2. And I claim that this sum has to be bigger than that sum. Why is that? Yeah? Uh, the way I'm thinking about it is if you were to grab log of n over 2 via a straight line versus n log 1 plus 2 plus 3, start to get bigger and eventually cross. No, you don't really have to think about the graphs. Not much more difficult to see than, than this one is. Yeah? Would it be, uh, would that simplify to log n squared over 2? N no. Log of n over 2 times how many terms you have. Yeah, that's not, that's not the right way to approach it either. Yeah? Log of n over 2 is the same as log of n minus log of 2. Yeah. So. But, <coughs> let me get your take. If you combine them, like, in the reverse order of what you just did, it would be log of n over 2 times log of n over 2 over n over 2 over 2, right? Yeah, okay. It might take a while to get where I want you to get, so let me just show you. Log of n is bigger than log of n over 2, right? So take the last half of the terms in this sum, starting from log of n over 2, and then log of n over 2 plus 1, and then log of n over 2 plus 2, then log of n over 2 plus 3, all the way up to log of n. Won't every one of those terms be greater than or equal to every one of these terms? Just pair them up. Pair this with log of n over 2. They're the same. Pair the next one with log of n over 2 plus 1. Log of n over 2 plus 1 is bigger than log of n over 2. So even ignoring the terms this starts with, if you, if you throw away the first half of the terms and just look at this sum, the last n over 2 terms of this sum, and compare them to these n over 2 terms, every one up here is greater than or equal to every one down here. Yeah? Well, couldn't you just think of this like a rectangle and just slice it back? I guess there are lots of ways to think about it, but... Um, you know, if you're taking, you know, if n is 10, we're comparing uh, log of log of 5 plus log of 6 plus log of 7 plus log of 8 plus log of 9 and so on with log of 5 plus log of 5 plus log of 5 plus log of 5. Same number of terms. So that's greater than or equal to that. So now, so this is just n over 2 times log of n over 2, which is that which is, you know, we can ignore the low order, the low order term and uh, leading constant, we get n log n. So log of n factorial is bounded above by n log n and bounded below by n log n. So it's, so if the lower bound is log of n factorial on comparison based sorting, it's also lower bound is log of n, is uh, O of n log n. Uh, log of n factorial grows at the same rate as uh, n log n. So that's how we can say that comparison-based sorting, any comparison-based sorting algorithm is omega of n log n, worst case. You just can't exceed that. Okay? So what do you think is more challenging to... What's it take to prove that an algorithm exists for a problem, uh, let's say, prove that an n squared algorithm exists for a problem. What would it take to prove that? Yeah. Can you give an example of an n squared algorithm? Right. You come up with an algorithm. What's it take to prove that something, an algorithm of a certain complexity, doesn't exist for a kind of problem? It's this kind of proof here. It's a harder thing. Proving that something exists, we're, we're usually better at finding an example of something. <coughs> 
information, and we are proving that no example exists. So that's why this, this, is, this seems, you know, seems kind of challenging at first. Because we're, we're proving something about that you can't do better than, no, no matter how clever you are, you can't do better than this little bit. Okay. Any last questions I could answer about this? Before we change topics? Yeah? Why is it important to prove um, what an algorithm can't be? Okay, he's asking, why is it important to prove that you can't do better than in log in? Yeah? You'll never spend your entire life looking for a linear uh, comparison sort algorithm because you know it doesn't exist. Right. It, it sort of frames the debate. We don't have to, you know, if we want to make a better sorting algorithm, you know that what you've got to do is find one that has lower constants. You can't do better asymptotically than in log in. Yeah? Like goes to say for comparison-based sorting. Are there other forms of sorting? Okay. So this is comparison-based sorting. There is an algorithm called radix sort that we'll look at later that doesn't sort by doing comparisons. That runs in linear time. But it's not... The reason we're interested in, uh, in um, comparison-based sorting is it's general purpose. You know, if, if, if you're interested in sorting things, by definition, you have to be able to compare them. So anything that's sortable can be sorted by a comparison-based algorithm. There, but there are lots of things that are sortable that can't be sorted by radix sort. And that's just a topic for another time. Any other questions? Okay. We will change topics. All right, so we're moving now into chapters Three and four. And it's about graphs. So, so first thing we got to discuss about is what is a graph. And formally, mathematically, a graph is a set of vertices and a set of edges, where an edge is a pair of vertices. So from that standpoint, how would you describe this graph right here? What would be the set of vertices? It'd be the set containing 1 through 7. So V is the set of vertices, 1 through 7. What would be the set of edges? A set, an edge is an ordered pair. So what would be an edge? Yeah? 1, 2. 1, 2. So 1, 2, there's a, so that says there's an edge from 1 to 2. Okay? And here's the set. Uh, <coughs> Now, we have to be a little bit careful. I said ordered pairs. So, uh, there's an edge from 1 to 2. There's also an edge from 2 to 1. So, technically, I should have added the reverse of all these edges. Or we could just agree that if there's an edge from A to B, there's also an edge from B to A in this example. Shouldn't it be sets and set ordered pairs? Should. Oh, sorry. Okay, now, intuitively, uh, we think of a graph as a, a way of representing relationships among objects. Um, we will use V and E. V will, consistently, we'll use V to stand for the set of all vertices, and we'll use E to stand for the set of all edges. Now, sometimes we'll use V to stand for the number of vertices, and E to stand for the number of edges. It's usually in complexity uh, formulas, we'll use V and E that way. And it's always clear from context which we're doing. Your book tends to use, when it was talking about the number of vertices, it'll put a V between two vertical bars, size of the set. Uh, I just find that notation kind of distracting. Uh, I use three symbols when I can use one, so that's what I tend to do. So there's a, there's a note. Sometimes, sometimes I mean V is the set, sometimes I mean V is the size of the set. But that shouldn't cause confusion. Okay, here's one thing that's important to know. Uh, the number of edges in any graph is O of V squared. So if we imagine if we connected every, ver ver every pair of vertices up with an edge, okay, you're going to have order of V squared edges. We can work out the exact number, but it's O of V squared. Now, what you'll find when we do complexity analysis using graphs is that you're used to talking about sorting as O of N squared. And we do that so much that people forget that N 
in that we say sorting is O of n squared, but first we say that they're in, in elements in the array. If we said there were x elements in the array, then we would say sorting is O of x squared. When we talk about graphs, our complexity formulas are going to contain what? D and E. Okay? So the important difference isn't that we're using different letters. The important thing is there are going to be two variables. Our complexities become more complex because they're going to be two, two things varying at the same time. Although they don't vary completely independently. There's a limit on how big B can be. Yeah. So, I mean, in this example, you have six that's not connected to anything. Right. Is that bottom point assuming that all of them have connections? Well, no. no. This bottom point's true. I mean, imagine if we just had seven completely unconnected vertices. Right. The number of, uh, number of edges would still be O of V squared. I'm not saying it's theta of V squared. Uh, okay. I'm saying this is an upper bound on the number of edges. All right, so there are lots of uses for graphs. Um, one, interesting, one thing to keep in mind is when you use binary trees in a program, you're typically using binary trees or hash tables or whatever to make your program more efficient. You're, you're representing something, uh, you know, you're, you're representing a set or a mapping and you want to make your program more efficient. <laughs> When you use a graph in a program, it's usually because you're using it to represent some aspect of the real world or some aspect of your problem. So it sort of has a different purpose. For example, you might want to know, uh, given a map of the states of Australia, which ones border the other ones. So that's the picture of Australia. That would be how you model it in a program. So one corresponds to Western Australia, two corresponds to Northern Territory. So they have a border. So one, one border is this and that. So that's how we would think about it. And this is how we would reduce it to a graph for a program. And then the program could reason about uh, borders in Australia. So that's called an undirected graph. If uh, one state borders another, then vice versa is also true. One borders two, two also borders one. Okay? This is an old visualization of the World Wide Web. I don't know that today's would look substantially different. Um, this is a directed graph. So we say there's a, there's a vertex from one, that there's an edge from one vertex to the other. If there's a, a link, say, say one is a web page, if there's a link in web page one to web page four, then there's an edge in the graph. And that's what you're looking at there. Now, why do we have to use a directed edge? Of an undirected one. Yeah? There might not be a link back. There might not be a link back. Right? Anyone can put an edge to any, any web page, but that doesn't make that web page point back to you. Now, what, what happens, they've studied this, what happens is you create a web page and you include links to other things. Eventually, there's a link back to your page, if only from Google. Eventually, Google finds it. So, uh, they, the pages tend to get uh, incorporated into the mass. Then there are dark places on the way out where the islands to themselves. Okay? Here's another kind of graph. This is also a directed graph, but this is a special one called a directed acyclic graph, which means that you can't, you can't go in cycles. You start somewhere, you go to the end, there's no way back. So this, for example, will be the prerequisite tree for, say, courses in computer science. So you've got to take one before two, and after you take two, you can take three, three or four. <coughs> you can substitute real courses for that if you want to. That's your prerequisite graph. A directed acyclic graph, special kind of graph. Uh, this is a weighted undirected graph. So now there's information associated with the edges. In this case, the number of miles between cities in Texas, road miles. So that's saying to get from one to two, it's 90 miles. To get from two to three, 85 miles, and so on. So it's undirected because you, you know, we're assuming that at least at this level the roads are not one way. Yeah. So would this basically be like what's underlying on like Google Maps or something? Sure, Google, you know, Google Maps has information like this at a much finer level right. of detail, and the map Google Maps, the graph Google Maps is working off of, is directed because roads can be one way in, you know, in cities, for example.
Okay? Now, this didn't get translated right. I translated it from um, PowerPoint. It left out my arrowheads, and I couldn't figure out how to get them back in this morning. Put an arrowhead on the curved line. This is a hiking map, and here I'm, I'm saying uh, this graph gives, it's a weighted directed graph. It gives me the time to hike between certain trail intersections. So imagine there's an arrowhead from 1 to 2 pointing toward 2, and then there's an arrowhead pointing back at the top. So you can go from 1 to 2, and it takes 65 minutes. Going from 2 to 1 takes 45 minutes. Why would the time be different? Elevation. Yeah, there's a hill, right? Walking uphill takes longer than walking downhill. So it would be directed if you're talking about time. Talk about miles, unless it's a one-way uh, trail. I suppose those exist. Um, you know, it would be the same both ways. And then here I was, what I was postulating was a, was a sort of a one-way cycle, so you have to hike in one direction. So there'd be an area head here, an area head here, an area head there. So you can walk, walk the other way. I think maybe bike paths are more like that. Yeah. Yeah, you can, so if you had, if, if, let's say that 1 to 2 was 45 in both directions. So you could have two, two edges, one leading to 2, one leading to 1. Or sometimes you'll see a single edge with arrowheads on both ends. It's just various ways to get the same idea across. Okay, so there are lots of use for graphs. Now, we're going to use, we're going to look at two ways. So consistently, when we look at graph algorithms, we're going to be considering two different ways of representing graphs. And the first way is with what's called an adjacency matrix. So we are going also going to assume that our vertices are numbered uh, consecutively so we can use them as array indexes. Now, typically, though, vertices aren't numbered. They may be labeled with strings. So in that case, what you've got to use, instead of using an array that, into which the... Um, Vertex numbers or indexes, what would you use instead of an array if the, if the vertices were strings? Yeah? Nodes and pointers? Well, no, not nodes and pointers. Yep. Map? Yeah, a map. A map of some kind. Say a hash map that mapped from. So instead of being an array, it would be a hash map. And you'd hash the string to find out uh, where to go. It's, it's, so we'll ignore that level of detail. So in a JC matrix, it's a two dimensional array indexed by vertex number. And so what does it mean when there's a 45 in row 1? So I'm just starting, I'm using one list indexing just for columns. And column 2, what does that mean? Yeah? So it means like it takes like a weight 45 from 1 to 2. Okay, so, so that's saying there's an edge from vertex 1 to vertex 2 whose weight is 45. Okay? So I've encoded the information in this graph into this matrix. So it's very easy to understand. Uh, it's also easy to analyze. It consumes V squared space. If there are V vertices, our graph is going to consume V squared space. Now, is that good or bad? What do you think of that representation? Yeah. Well, that's always worst case. Well, well he says it's always worst case. Another way of putting that is, if you don't have many edges, it's a waste of space. If you have lots of edges, that's fine. But imagine a giant graph like that that had very few edges. For example, suppose you created, wouldn't be able to do this, you created a, a JC matrix representing the World Wide Web, where every vertex was a web page, and there's an edge, there's an edge between two vertices if there's a link in this web page that references that web page. Would there be a lot of edges? Would there be a lot of wasted space or a little wasted space? A lot of wasted space. A tremendous amount of wasted space because you pick two web pages at random, the odds that one refers to the other is, is zero. You know, rounded. So it'd be, it'd be a tremendous amount of wasted space. It'd, it'd be hopeless. There's not enough memory in the world to store that graph. Could you explain Just think of the rows are the froms, the columns are the twos. So from 
where uh, row three here, so from row from vertex three, you can get there is an edge to vertex two column that's weighted fifty five. So over here, three to two, there's an edge weighted fifty five. That's an JC matrix. Now here's an JC matrix. What it looks like if we don't have weights. So now you're just storing bits, true or false. Is there an edge or not? And that can be made really compact. But still V squared space. Okay, here's an undirected graph. Now, what property does the JC matrix for an undirected graph have? It's symmetrical about this about this bag over here. Because if there's an edge, you know, an, an edge from four to three, there's going to be an edge from three to four. That's if it's undirected. And that's an undirected, unweighted graph. Again, symmetrical. All right. Adjacent C list is another approach. So what you have now is a a, a um, an array at the top indexed by vertex number, and then a list hanging down of the edges out of each vertex. So this is where it's easy to see how you could use a hash table instead. So if, if your vertices were strings, you'd have a hash table where, that contained, where each bucket contained a list of vertices. Okay? So, you know, out of vertex 1, we just have the edge to 2. And out of uh, vertex 2, we have edges to 1 and 4, and we can store the weights. How do we know this consumes E plus V space? Yeah? You need something to store every vertex and something to store every edge. Right. So we got that array up top, which is proportional to V. So the length of that array is just proportional to V. And then the number of these guys that we have is E. We have E of these little things. So it's E plus V. Okay, here is, what have I done? Okay, thank you. It's unweighted, but my, my, my graph is still weighted. That's what an unweighted graph looks like. You just don't need the weights. And here is an undirected one. It's not as obvious that it's symmetrical, but you end up, you end up with edges being stored twice, once in each direction. And there is undirected, unweighted. So we've got these two ways of representing a graph. Which way is better? Yeah? Um, well, the, so we know that we want uh, speed over space generally. Um, and so the uh, 2D matrix is a lot faster. OK. Sure. The JC matrix, it's really fast to look, up, look and see if a particular edge exists. And this one be Right, but typically you don't want to know whether an edge exists. Most algorithms, what you got to find out is what are all the edges out of the vertex. So you're somewhere you want to know where you can go from there. Now the speed, the speed comparison isn't so favorable for a JC matrix because if the JC matrix is mostly empty, it could take a tremendously long time to iterate across, you know, the billion elements of the first row of the JC matrix. Whereas going down a very short list in this structure, it would be very fast. So the answer is it depends. It depends on the graph. Some graphs are better represented using matrix. Some are, represented, are better represented using the, uh, the list. So we have terms for those graphs. Some graphs we say are sparse. That's when the number of edges is O of V. So the number of edges is you know, no more than some constant times V. And a dense graph is one that has v squared edges, omega of v squared edges. So uh, lots of edges. So dense and sparse. Um, so if you have a sparse graph and you represent it using a matrix, it takes v squared space. It takes v squared space for any matrix. But for, if we represent a sparse graph of a list, it takes only theta of the space, because that v plus e turns into v plus v, because uh, e is bounded by v. 
So it just takes linear space. On the other hand, if you've got a dense graph, the matrix and the list are both v squared. So the, 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 uh, what we do is, if we, use, if we have a dense graph, we use a matrix because they're more compact. And if it's sparse, we use a list so we don't waste all that space. Here's a question. Are most graphs that you encounter in the world <coughs> dense or sparse? Sparse. sparse? sparse. It's hard to think of a dense graph. I mean, think about a graph of airline routes, okay, where th there's an edge from a city to another city if you can fly nonstop between those two cities. It'd be nice if that were a dense graph, because <laughs> then we could fly anywhere pretty much in one hop. But if you've traveled to Atlanta before, you know, or any hub city, you know that the graph is not dense. Who can think of a dense graph? I have a hard time doing it. It's yeah. airlines, but only the top cities. You just chop off all the little ones. Okay, so you take, sort of take the world, well, even that. Well, if you take the capitals of the, uh, uh, of the 20 richest countries, and we looked at nonstop flights between them, maybe that would be a dense graph. Yeah? Like uh, visible stars from the sky. So, okay, so the vertices correspond to stars. Yeah. And what would the edges correspond to? Uh, you can see other stars. So if you can see one star from another star? Okay. So if we're talking about all the stars in the universe, that's definitely not a dense graph. If you're talking about all the stars within 10 light years of Earth, yeah, you can make that dense. Yeah, so there's an example. Yeah? We feel like a graph like on Facebook and everyone who's friends with everyone. Well, the way you would represent friendship on Facebook would be there's a vertex from you to this person if you were friends. Right. And you are not friends with <laughs> pick a random person on Facebook, probably not your friend. Now, what you describe is what you want to do once you've got that friendship graph is figure out is there a chain of friends that leads you from one place to another. Now, the result of that computation, if you represent it as a graph, would be dense. I'll uh, start. You first. Soccer team, any player can kick a ball to another player on the soccer team. True, yeah. So if, if our graph is players on a soccer team and can and you have an edge if one player can kick to another, that would be dense. Do you have a different idea? It's totally useless, but um, if you make a toast and you toast to every other person in the group. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, so just leave it there. Most graphs we encounter turn out to be sparse. All right, now let's compare some simple operations. If we want to know, is there an edge from U to V on a matrix, that takes constant time. <coughs> you just go into the array and pluck out the answer. On a list, it's O of V. Why is it O of V <coughs> to know if there's an edge from U to V? You okay? You represented your, your edges. Well, right. Well, what's the operate? What's it going to take to find out if there's an edge? What's the worst that could happen if you want to know if there's an edge between two vertices? You have to search through the. You got to search through one of these one of these chains, right? But couldn't you store that as a hash table as well? Well, let's just let's just stick to this representation. So the worst that you can do is search this list. <coughs> okay. How long can that list be? Can't be any longer than V. It also can't be any longer than E. Right? You, can, you have at most V edges from one vertex to another, and so that's one bound. The other bound is you, you can't have more than all the edges in a list. So it's both O of V and O of E. Is there an edge out of U? So I, I just say, is there an edge out of vertex three? What would it take to answer that question? in an adjacency matrix. Yeah. Go through a whole row <coughs> linearly. You'd have to go through a whole row in the worst case. You can stop as soon as you find an, a, a, an edge, but maybe the row is all zeros. So in the worst case, it takes O of V time. You've got to look at an entire row. Yet in a list, you can do it in constant time. Why can't you do it? Find out if there's an edge out of a vertex in constant time. Go with that one there. Yeah? You just go, you go right here, and if there is anything other than null stored right there, there's some edge out. 
identifying all the edges out of the vertex. Right? In the matrix, okay, you iterate through, so it's going to take V time. On a list, you have to follow along these chains. And again, that's O of V and O of E. If you want to consume the entire data structure, which you often do, it takes V squared time to look at every spot of it. It takes O of E plus V time down here. And so which is faster depends on how big E is. Okay, let's take a break and we'll look at an actual algorithm. Start again. All right, here's our first algorithm. It applies to undirected graphs. And the idea is called explore. The idea is to find, is to systematically visit every vertex that's reachable from a given vertex B. So we pick a starting place and we try to uh, find every vertex that's reachable. And there's our code. Uh, we're going to assume that we have an array called visited that's initially uh, full of falses. And we set visited V to true when we visited vertex V. Uh, Pre-visit and post-visit are, we're going to use, right now they're just methods that do nothing. Uh, once we get this algorithm figured out, we'll change, we'll have them actually do something, with, uh, but not for now. So here's our algorithm. <coughs> You look at, you find every, so that for each V, U, and E, that means for every edge from V to U, so we know what V is, so from every, every place you can get from, uh, every edge from V to U, if you haven't visited U, you recursively explore. Okay? So let's, <coughs> let's work through this and see what's going on. So... First thing, we're asked to explore from A. So we're given a graph, and V is initially A, so we mark it as visited. What's going to happen next? Okay. 
What edges, so this loop right here, for each edge in E of the form BU, so remember B is A at this point, uh, what edges are there? Yeah? I'm sorry, what is U again? For each B, U. I want every edge of the form BU, or, or since B is known to be A, I want every edge of the form AU. I'm asking you, essentially I'm asking what, what can, what would, what are the possibilities for you here? Hey, U is an unbound variable. Right? This is pseudo code. I want every edge that starts at A and ends up somewhere. What are all the somewheres? Yeah? B and D. Yeah, B and D. So the edge AB is of the form VU and the edge AD is of the form VU. Now, in reality, this would be some sort of uh, iterator that's each time it produces a different edge. Okay, so we got to pick one. So we'll start with we'll start with the edge from A to B. So what do we do? Mark B as visited. You recursively call explore on B, and the first thing it does is mark B as visited. Okay, now now we're inside that uh, call to uh, explore of B. So what's it going to do? <coughs> So it, it's got these two edges, one from B to C, one from B to E. So it's, we're just picking them out in order because we've got to pick them in some order. So it will call explore C, which will mark C as true. And it will start looking at edges out of C. It will find that edge from C to B, but why will it ignore it? Because it's marked visited. So there's nothing left to do, so the recursion returns. And now we're, uh, well, this isn't. The recursion turns to B, and B tries the other edge out of it that it hadn't tried yet. So it goes to E. Right? So now we're three levels deep in the recursion. E tries to go back to B, but that's been visited. So now E will visit D. D will consider going to A, but that's visited. It'll consider going to E, and that's visited. Nowhere to go, so we return, 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 and it ends. So we've identified uh, the yellow vertices are the ones that are reachable from A. That's what this algorithm tells us. Yep? Once it returns back to A, will it go to D from there? Or, oh, no. oh, sure. When it, when it returns back to A's stack frame, A will try to visit D. But D's already visited, so... Yeah? What does post-visit do? Pre and post-visit do nothing right now. It will eventually do something. So what, the way I've colored it is, I've colored all the vertices as they were visited. And I've colored all the edges that were actually used, the ones that were actually followed successfully. And, and if you look at the, those edges form a tree rooted at A that sort of <coughs> hooks, hooks together all the vertices that we visit. Okay, so Explore systematically visits all the vertices. All right? We're going to take that and use it for, depth, for an algorithm called Depth First Search. So what depth first search does is it first visit, it marks every uh, vertex as unvisited, marks them as false. And then for every vertex, if it has not been visited, it explores it. Okay? So let's say we call DFS of A on A. What's going to happen? Mark A is visited. A is visited. And where will A go? Where will we go from A? B. We'll go to B. C. We'll go to C. We'll back up to B and go to E. E will go to D. And at that point, that's everywhere we can get. We'll back out and try different things, but eventually we'll find no new vertices to visit. Okay? So that means explore or return, and we're back in depth or search. And, it, and so it just said for each B in B. So first it got A and, and explored it. Will it explore B next? It's already been visited. It's already been visited. So it'll, it'll consider B, and C, and D, and E, so that loop is spinning. They've all been visited. Finally, it's going to find F. F is unvisited, so it'll do another exploration. So it'll explore starting at F, which will find G, and then, then we're done. So explore is the key. Right first search just explores an unvisited vertex, and when that's all explored, it finds the next unvisited vertex and explores it. So depending on how many chunks there are in the graph, that's how many times depth first search we call explore. Okay. Okay. Now let's do something with pre-visit. I want to number the vertices. I want to. I'm going to have a a, uh, 
an array called uh, CCNum for connected component number, and index by vertice, by vertex, and uh, this will be uh, a number. So this one has two clumps. So we, we want to, in the end, we want to know that A, D, E, B, and C are all in clump one, and F and G are all in clump two. So all we have to do is this. We start out this global variable CC as being one, and then every time we visit, we, every time we visit a vertex, we also call pre-visit, and pre-visit stores the current value of CC into the array. So A is one, we explore to B, it gets a one, we explore to C, it gets a one, we explore to A, it gets a one, and so on. Then, when that exploration is done, we increment CC before we, uh, before we loop again. And so when it visits F, it'll get a two. Okay, so we found that there are two connected clumps, two connected components, and furthermore, we have labeled each vertex according to which clump it's in. So that's an application breadth first search. We do something with, by doing something special with pre-visit. All right, now we're going to do something different with pre-visit. And at first, it won't, it won't be obvious why we're doing it. But I've got clock up there, the global variable. It starts out at 1. And every time we call pre-visit, we're, we're going to store clock as the pre-number of vertex V, and then we're going to increment clock. And same thing with post. So uh, for, for right now, these numbers are meaningless. Let's see how it turns out. So when we visit A, we mark it yellow. And then we pre-visit it. So what will its pre-number be? One. one. So it starts at one. Then we go to B and pre-visit it. What will its pre-number be? Two. two. If we visit C, its pre-number is three. Now, we find no new vertices to visit out of C. So uh, after, after we have explored all we can out of C, we hit post-visit. So what will C's post-visit number be? One. That's the same numbers. So it's four. Okay? We go back to, what will happen next? We'll, we'll continue exploring out of B, so what will be visited next? E, and it'll get a pre-number of five. Then D will get a pre-number of six. What happens next? Which number is assigned next? Seven to D. Right, we're, there's nowhere to go from D, so it gets the seven. No, nowhere need to go from E, so it gets the eight. B gets the nine. A gets the ten. Now, breadth first search. You know, we're done exploring out of A, so breadth first search looks, looks for an unvisited vertex. It finds F, calls explore, and it gets the pre number of eleven. G gets twelve. No nowhere to go. Thirteen. So seven vertices, we assign pre and post numbers between one and fourteen, uniquely to each each vertex. Yeah. You keep calling this breadth first search. I learned it as depth first search. Oh, did I say breadth first? Yeah, you said it. <laughs> All right. A few times. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's definitely. It says DFS up here. Yeah, this is depth first search. <laughs> There's a record on the camera. Now. That's, that's why people don't like the video. All right, sorry about that. Yeah, this is all depth first search. Any other questions or corrections? So, what cool, must, so what cool things can we do? Okay, what cool things can you do with this? Okay. Um, I am going to, I, there's a topic I want to be sure that I get to. And so I'm going to, just bear with me a second. I have to, Come back to the analysis of depth first search. I do want to get to the cool thing. So, all right. So now, unfortunately, I have to switch over to PowerPoint because I haven't converted these slides to PowerPoint. I'll try to. Google Docs. Yeah, Google Docs is, is a big win, but anyway, I won't tell you the story. Here. Let's try this algorithm on a directed graph. Okay. So, what's the first? So. Basically, when we call depth first search on a 
on a graph. It's got a, it just picks, it goes through the vertices in some order looking for unvisited ones. So we're just going to assume, to make this concrete, that we start with vertex, we consider the vertices in alphabetical order. We've got to do them in some order. So we'll visit A first, and what number will it get? D. You will get a 1. Okay. B will get 2. Then where will it go? C. So C, which will get a 3. And a 4. And a 4. Then it'll go back to B, and now it'll explore E, e which will get a 5. And from there, it'll find, it'll look, it'll try to go to C, but no go. So it'll go to D and give it a 6. And then it'll try to go to B, that doesn't work out. So now we're through with D, it'll get the 7. We're through with E, it'll get an 8. We're through with B, it'll get a 9. We'll go back to A, it'll try to go to D, that won't work at all. 10. So I'm, co I'm not even going to go into today what the colors are for, what the colors mean. I just want you to see that you can you do this sort of thing on a, uh, on a directed graph. Now what will happen? Just after trying to jump to all of them. Right, so it'll consider, it'll look at B, C, D, E, all have been visited. So it'll consider F, which will get the next number, 11. G gets the 12 the 13, and the 14. Now, yeah? Why are we keeping track of the posts? Why are we keeping track of the post numbers? Okay, I want you to look at the post numbers and tell me if you see any pattern. Okay, this is specific. Well, I take that back. This is not a DAG. This is a directed graph. So I'm going to defer your question. We're going to look at a directed graph next. So there's stuff I'm skipping over. I want to get to the payoff. Let's repeat this exercise. <coughs> Directed acyclic graphs I already mentioned are useful for, for, des for describing things that have priority, like a uh, prerequisite graph in a, in a class. Okay, these are all examples. Course A must be taken before course B. Spreadsheet cell B must be evaluated before cell E, and so on. A common thing you want to do for directed acyclic graphs is to put them in order from what are called the, the sources, which are the vertices with no edges in, and the sinks like C and F, which are vertices with no edges out. So what would be a linearization of this graph here? Alright, you, you, you have to go to A first, and what, what do you have to go to next? D. And once you've gone to D, you can, go to, you can do B. Then, since you've done both D and B, you can do E. At that point, you have a choice. C would come next, or G could come next. And F has to be last. So there are a couple ways to do it. And you can end up with, you have to start with A, D, B, E. And after that, you could have C, G, F, or G, C, F, or whatever. G, F, C. That's a linearization. So those are the three possibilities. And as I mentioned, the source is a vertex with no edges coming in, a sink going out. This is why we're interested in post times. In a DAG, every edge leads to a vertex with a lower post time. Okay? So let's, let's work this out. Well, I'm not going to work it out. I just want to look at it right now. Okay? So it doesn't matter what order you make the arbitrary choices. Let's suppose we start instead of with A, let's start with G. So it gets a time of 1, pre-time of 1. F will get the 2. Now what? F gets a 3. G gets a 4. Now you've got to restart somewhere because we're stuck. So depth for a search we call explore. Let's say it calls it on E for some reason. It would get the 5. C would get 6 and 7. E gets 8. Then let's say we restart at D. It gets the 9. We get the 10, the 11, the 12. Restart on A is 13 and 14. Now, does every edge lead from a higher post time to a lower post time? You know, A to B goes from 14 to 11. E to C goes from 8 to 7. D to E goes from 12 to 8. So what we've identified is an algorithm <coughs> to linearize, to topologically sort a directed acyclic graph. 
Okay? You just run depth first search on it and, and then sort in descending order of post time, and you have a linearization. Now, what linearization would we get if we sorted this graph? In reverse order of post time. No, in reverse, descending order of post time. What would come from? Yeah. A, D, B, E. A, D, B, E. C. C, G, G, F. So we know there are three possible linearizations. That's just determined. There are arbitrary choices you make about which vertices to visit first. Flips of the coin, if you will. And different choices will lead to different linearization. But the key thing about the linearization is there are no, all the edges lead from, go from left to right. There's not going to be an edge from F back to <coughs> F has to be a sink. A has to be a source. And we'll see why that's important in a second. Okay, here's, here's another example. Let's start at A then. <coughs> so A gets the 1, B gets 2, then what? E gets 3, C gets 4, and then it's done. Then we pop back to E, and it explores to G, which explores to F, which gets a post time of 8. G gets the 9. E gets the 10. We go back to B. We go, you know, back to B, no new way out. Back to A, it'll explore. Okay, so it gets the 11. Then we explore from A to D, we get the 12, the 13, the 14. It's still true, isn't it? Every edge leads from a higher post time to a lower post time. So that's the topological sort algorithm. You uh, determine the post times, sort in ascending order of post time. Sort the vertices in ascending order of post time. So, what if you start at B and then? If you start at oh. B, I'll let you look at more examples, but this, you know, the two we have worked out, there's a proof there that I may or may not talk about next time. Because I want to get to, I'm going to skip over the complexity of topological sort. Called, and I'm going to skip over that because I want to get to the uses of topological sort. <coughs> because your caddis problem for next week <coughs> is on a deck. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm racing here. I got seven minutes to eight minutes to get you ready for this. So now everyone pays attention. <laughs> All right. Now, this is something that I seem to be unable to convince students of. That when you have an algorithm on a DAG, Almost every time you topologically sort the DAG and then process it in topological order by applying, you know, you what you do is you topologically sort it and then do a computation on each vertex, a non recursive computation on each vertex in topological order. And we'll look at an example shortly. Or you reverse topologically sort it and go in backwards topological order. Okay? Despite saying this over and over again to students, I look at what they do on these caddis problems, and it's like there's this divide. What I say in the class, I think people get into caddis and they think, oh, this is the real world. I don't have to deal with that crap. <laughs> <laughs> and they struggle. And, and so I am going to climb up on the desk. You will never forget this moment. <laughs> if you are asked to create an algorithm on a DAG, the first step is to topologically sort it. The next step is to apply a simple computation to each vertex, either in topological order or reverse topological order. Okay? Don't try to do it any other way. <laughs> okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. This represents a spreadsheet. Okay? And we've got an arrow here that, we've got, it's like they got, take that times operator here. Uh, two feeds into the times operator. So in what port? And I've done a, uh, but what's in white is the value of the vertex currently. So suppose A changes from 2 to 7. In what order should we reevaluate the vertices? A up there, the black changes to a 7. 
So, the white is what's displayed by the spreadsheet. So, yeah, so A changes to 7. First of all, which vertices need to be recomputed? A, B, B, C. Right. How could you identify which ones need to be computed? What's, what's a one word answer or a two word answer? I've got three words in mind. A changes. Yeah. Reachability test. Yeah. You just explore from A. And all the vertices you can reach from A need to be reevaluated. In what order must they be reevaluated? Should you start with node C and do that plus? No. 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 You should, should you start with node F and do the times? No. So when, how do we determine the order in which to do the update of each vertex? Topologically sorted, thank you. <laughs> and do it in order. So we would start with A. Its new value is 7. Then what will we do next? 7 plus 5. Okay, so we would do B next. Um, and so you, you do the 7 plus 5, then you would do the B. I wonder how bit I have this. Okay. Oh, you have to reverse. So this is the linearization we get if we did the post time analysis. And then, for each vertex in sorted order, look up the value of the predecessors, compute, and save the new value. That's the simple operation we do. So, we change that to 7. So now we're going to do it in order. A's new value is 7. Then it says to do D. Its new value is 12. Then it says to do F. Its new value is, what, 12 times 7. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, F. Its new value is uh, 12 times 5. Then it says to do B. And then it says to do C. We don't have to do some awful recursion that finds the right order. We just sort it, and then we just do the computation. Once per vertex. Simple as can be. What if I want to know the number of paths for a given vertex, or the number of different paths to get there from the source? Okay? There's the answer. Why is there a 3 right here on E? Why are there three paths? Yeah. You can go from A to B to E, from A to D to E, or from A to D to B to E. Exactly. There's just three paths you can go there. Yeah. So I want to figure out, uh, for every vertex, I want to see how to figure out these numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate with every vertex that number that you saw. If B is a source, that number is 1. There's only one way to get to the source, from a source. Otherwise, we add up. The, um, the, the number of ways, different ways there are to get to all my predecessors. <coughs> so, what's the first thing we ought to do? We want to do the topological sort. Right? <coughs> and there's the topological sort right there. I've, I've sorted for you. So, why do we stick at A? Since it has no, no edges in, it's a source, so it gets a 1. Okay, next we do D. Remember, what you do is you look at all your predecessors and you add up their number of ways there are to get to them. So what do we put to D? One. 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 Then B looks at its predecessors. It sees a one and a one. Two. So we add those up, we get a two. See, there's a simple operation for each vertex, non-recursive. The topological sort makes sure that the values, the numbers you need, have been computed before you compute your value. So now we can do E by adding up the 2 and the 1. We get the 3. We can do C. It only has one predecessor, which is a 3. The G C is 6. And the F C is 6. <coughs> topological order. There's one more example I'll look at next time. We're, it's, again, we do the topological sort, but this final example has to work backwards in time. It's because of the way the problem is defined. So it works in reverse topological order, but still, it's simple computation, non-recursive, per vertex. <coughs>